Uh, thank you everyone for coming. And um, hopefully if you're here, you have uh, the desire to convert your landscape or maybe it already is a Florida friendly landscape or maybe you have a, you know, a grass filled yard and you wanna learn how to convert it to this Florida friendly landscape using less chemicals, water and things like that to obtain natural, beautiful areas. Um, so today we're gonna be talking a lot about how to do this. Um, on a budget as well. So um, hopefully you guys all learn something today and uh, can take something you learn from this uh, this talk and apply it to your own landscape. And hopefully um, we can make South Florida a beautiful and inviting place to live. Um, you know, it's full of all kinds of wildlife where we coincide well with our, um, our natural areas. So my name is Dalton Goolsby. I'm the supervisor of the Urban Horticulture Program. I just wanna thank everyone again for showing up today. Um, I'm going to be presenting about Florida Friendly Landscaping today, which is an awesome program that uh, both myself and my boss, Laura, along with our team, um, help implement here in Miami-Dade County. Uh, this presentation was actually produced by my boss, Laura. Um, I've added a few slides, um, so I'm going to be presenting today for you. Okay, get into it. So um, for those of you who aren't aware or, or familiar with the extension, um, basically, what we do is we take all of the research being done by the University of Florida. It's a, uh, a, a leading university in uh, field, different fields of research. And basically, it's our job at, at the Extension Office to extend this research to our local communities. Um, so our program, as I said, is the Urban Horticulture Program. So we do uh, workshops, uh, provide educational materials, um, do these kinds of events, tabling events all over the county to just try and... Um, make people more Florida friendly, it basically just assess less of an impact in their in their Florida landscape. So just a little highlight of our program quickly. Um, if you aren't familiar with us, we do these, um, these kinds of workshops all over the county, um, virtually. We present for schools, um, even sometimes we'll present for governments, do fun tabling activities. Uh, we even, our program even encompasses the Master Gardener program here in Miami-Dade County. Uh, my boss, Laura, is the coordinator for that. So we uh, we really do a little bit of everything here. We uh, t tell people how to you know assess less of an impact on our environment, how to conserve water. All these things are free resources. And uh, one of the awesome things that I also like to highlight that we offer, and I'll highlight again later in my talk, is um, pest and disease identification. If you have a problem in your landscape, you can send us photos or a sample, and we can tell you what it is and uh, how to um, you know the best least toxic way to. Uh, fix these problems in your landscape when they arise. And that'll go a long way to conserving you money, uh, serving you a little bit of headache, and also um, protecting our environment. All right, so for those of you who aren't aware, um, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a statewide program that promotes science-based, low-impact, sustainable, environmentally friendly landscaping that conserves water and reduces pollutant loading by using less chemical to uh, create these beautiful and sustainable landscapes in South Florida. Um, so this program is based around nine principles that we're, we're going to go through and highlight each of those and how it applies to your landscape. And um, basically, if you, um, you know, you, you, you are able to implement a couple of these into your landscape, um, you can really start to see savings in uh, your, your money. You're going to be spending less on chemicals, um, spending less on replacing plants, spending less on your um, maintenance crew. You know, a lot of the maintenance crews today, they want to come through, they want to cut your stuff, they want to mow your grass, they want to take all that, uh, that yard waste away and just be done with it. They want to, we, we call it cut, mow, and blow. And uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping is a nice way, a nice alternative to some of these kind of conventional methods that have um, swept across Florida. So we'll look at some of those as well. And uh, real quickly, I'd just like to point out that actually Florida Friendly Landscaping is part of a Miami-Dade County ordinance. This pertains to the right-of-ways. Um, if you've ever seen like, um, you know, driving down the road, you've got those medians and you'll see a lot of uh, Florida Friendly drought tolerant plants in those medians. Um, a lot of these uh, are uh, Florida native plants that, you know, don't need a lot of water. They, they've evolved in Florida without excess, you know, irrigation, without fertilizer without pesticide for thousands of years. So the idea is why, why should they need it now, right? And uh, Miami-Dade County is actually implementing this um, through this ordinance in our, in our right-of-ways and things like that, um, installing Florida-friendly drought-tolerant plants. So you see about 50% of the plant material in these easements should be low-maintenance drought-tolerant. And the, the reason for that is, is so um, if you've ever been at Chrome in the afternoon, you know, in the summer months, you'll see that water truck going up and down and watering those trees. They, they're literally starting to wilt in the middle uh, of, 
of you know those easements there. It's because um, they're probably not picking the the most drought tolerant, best selection for some of these plants, right? Um, so if and this this can be applied to your landscape as well. If you're selecting Florida native drought tolerant plants, especially ones that are well suited to grow here in South Florida, um, then you're going to need they're going to need less maintenance overall. And really, um, this gets into our first principle, which is right plant, right place. Which really I like to call this kind of our cornerstone principle as well. Um, because if you're putting plants in the uh, right spot in your landscape where they're best suited to grow, whether it's, um, you know, uh, sunlight availability, water availability, um, you're grouping them around similar plants that have similar nutrient and watering needs, um, you know, those plants are going to need less maintenance, less um, inputs of, of chemical fertilizer, pesticides, things like that, because they're going to be set up for success by just being in the right spot in your landscape. And that's a huge, huge thing. But uh, I just really want to quickly highlight each of our nine principles that make up our Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Uh, you heard me say the, the right plant, right place is our cornerstone principle, because really all the others are going to kind of fall into line if you're putting plants in the spot where they're best uh, suited to grow in your landscape. Um, you know, you're going to need to water less. Um, you're going to need to apply less chemical like fertilizer and pesticide because, um, you know, it's it, it, in, the, in the case of like insects, sometimes if a plant's stressed out, it allows pests and diseases to infiltrate that plant. Well, if the plant is healthy, being planted in the right spot in, the, in your landscape, then that goes a long way to reducing those needs for pesticides and things like that. Anyway, like I said, we're going to get uh, we're going to break down each of those individually. And uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time right now on our cornerstone principle, right plant, right place. Um, so replacing problem prone plants is very important. Um, and usually when I'm when I think of this, I really think of grass. And number one um, problem I see with grass is uh, especially under trees um, and things like that, areas where this grass doesn't get a lot of shade. Um, our, our grass here in South Florida needs a lot of a lot of sun, right? It needs a lot of water to grow, usually a lot of fertilizer as well. So um, underneath the tree where it's not getting a lot of sun, you know, the, the, the grass is, I mean, the, the ground is staying very wet underneath these areas because it's just staying more shaded. Um, the grass is really going to struggle in a lot of these areas. And if you guys have maybe a hammock in your backyard with lots of live oaks, you'll notice the grass, uh, you might have replaced the grass a few times already because the grass doesn't really like growing in these shady areas. Well, instead of constantly repurchasing grass and installing it when it's destined to fail, why not try and install, you know, a Florida friendly um, a shrub, like a low growing shrub underneath the tree, maybe a ground cover. And um, you can contact us here at the extension office and we can literally send you a slew of resources, recommendations and things like that, that will not only be more attractive in my opinion than that grass, but also um, reduce your inputs of water and um, the need to replace those plants as well. And one thing I like to just to talk about grass because grass is always gonna need the most water in your landscape, the most fertilizer, um, it's going to need a lot of pesticide, unfortunately, here in South Florida, um, unless you're maintaining it correctly. Um, you know, uh, you, you can, first of all, you're going to be spending a lot of money, um, you know, always watering, always buying fertilizers and things like that. When a Florida native plant can accomplish the same goal and be more attractive than that grass can um, with using less uh, resources, right, less input of money. Um, the thing about grass, I'm a big uh, pollinator guy here in South Florida. Um, right now, our pollinators are, are, are invertebrate pollinators, meaning pollinators that don't have a backbone. These are things like bees, butterflies, um, flies, all these things, uh, very important pollinators. Um, however, they're undergoing what's called a pollinator apocalypse right now, where um, species extinction rates are 100 to 1,000 times higher than their historical averages because people are uh, improperly applying pesticide um, destroying pollinator habitat and replacing it only with grass. You know, um, obviously to build homes, they've got to destroy natural areas with natural native plants that have been growing in those areas. And um, unfortunately, what we see is when we destroy these natural areas and we come back through and replant these areas to, you know, get ready for a neighborhood to move in, half the time all we're planting in those areas is grass, maybe a pot of carpus. Um, but on the topic of grass, Grass doesn't produce any water, it doesn't produce any shade, doesn't produce any nectar, doesn't have a flower, doesn't really give a place for butterflies to lay their eggs or pollinators to lay their eggs besides a very few species of grass skippers. Um, so really, if you look at grass objectively, it's kind of a pollinator desert. That's what I like to call it. Um, 
And, you know, us as humans, we can't really survive in a desert. So how can we expect our pollinators to? Um, so, you know, not only you, if you're replacing some of these problem prone plants in your landscape with our native pollinator friendly plants, not only are they going to be very beautiful, produce a nice pretty flower, they're going to be attracting butterflies and bees and other things to your landscape, but also um, you're going to save yourself a lot of headache, just always, always, you know, trying to get that grass perfect. And actually, University of Florida has done studies that have actually shown that um, uh, I think it's either eight out of 10 people or nine out of 10 people prefer a Florida native yard compared to an all grass landscape. So it's surprising to me that more people don't have these native landscapes in their yard. I think it's kind of a little bit of um, a misconception about um, native yards always kind of being really weedy. Um, I can, I, I'll, throughout the course of this presentation, you guys will see multiple examples of landscapes that are attractive. Um, they're not, they're still native landscapes, but they're aesthetically pleasing. And that's, that should be the goal with Florida Friendly Landscaping. Um, so always group plants according to their nutrient um, water needs, their light needs, things like that. And this is the reason for the photo I've uh, provided here in this slide. Um, here in this one photo, we can see looks like some some um, ornamental grass in the background with looks like those are impatiens, a moss rose in the front, which is kind of a succulent, kind of more drought tolerant plant. You've got the palm growing right there as well. And uh, you've got, of course, that little tiny section of grass right there. So in this one photo, I see maybe five or six different nutrient plants and water needs in this one small area. So, you know, if there's a spray head, a spray sprinkler head, um, you know, just laying down water over this whole area, that grass is probably going to be getting the water needs, the water it needs, right? But that moss rose and all those ornamentals are probably going to be getting way overwatered, which, like I said earlier, is going to invite pests, going to invite disease, um, fungal issues are going to arise, you know, when things are getting overwatered, root rot, all these problems are spawned by overwatering, improper watering. Um, also, you want to always try and stop the spread and use of invasive and exotic plants. You guys can go on Google and search um, invasives, or what I like to do is go on the UF IFAS assessment website, and if there's a certain plant in your yard, um, you see it, you know, a lot of volunteers and suckers growing up underneath that thing. It might be invasive. You might want to do a little research. Should I have this plant? Is there something better? You know, maybe this might be a nice, attractive plant, but I guarantee you there's probably something that's very similar that's Florida friendly. It's not going to throw seeds, not going to offset local plants, native plants, which are then going to offset native wildlife. That's what we want to avoid, right? With those invasives. All right. So just a couple other photos to show you these probably aren't the right plant in the right place. Uh, the one on the left side, you can see, um, looks like a bird of paradise, maybe a traveler's palm. I can't really tell from the angle, but um, you can see that's a pretty tall plant there, right? And it's, you know, right up on the side of their house. It's going to be growing up underneath their um, their overhang there. It could even sometimes, if that was a larger tree, it could, it could uh, compromise their foundation of their home. So it's probably not the right plant for the right place. You know, if you've got a large tree or shrub or ornamental plant like that growing next to your house, you're going to have to constantly be cutting it back on one side to keep it off of your home, which is going to open up wounds on the plant. Just like, you know, when we get a cut, we need to put Neosporin and a bandage on it. So, you know, um, disease can't get into our, can't affect us, right? Well, it's the same with the plant. If you're cutting a limb off the plant, you're opening up a wound where disease and pests can get in, right? So if you're, planting, if you're considering the mature size of a plant before you plant it, that's one of the major parts of right plant, right place is considering mature size of a plant before you go plant a live oak five feet from your house, right? You want to make sure this thing is going to have enough room to grow and spread and be beautiful without me cutting it back a lot. And in the right photo, um, this is kind of just grouping plants based on watering needs. You can see they did do that. However, there's a sprinkler right in the middle of, of this group of bromeliads, which don't really need any additional water, right? They kind of they kind of have their own water tank to store water naturally. They don't need to be, um, they don't need supplemental irrigation like they're receiving here. So probably not the right plant for that spot. And um, this is just another resource for you to look up invasives. Um, I just told you about the UF IFAS assessment website. This is the um, Florida Exotic Pest and Plant Council website. You can also go on here. Um, you want to be looking up uh, the invasive status of these plants. Is it category one? Is it category two? Things like that. Okay. So we're getting into our next, um, our next, I guess, principle here for Florida friendly landscaping, which is watering efficiently. And um, if you couldn't, if you couldn't tell, this is probably, if not, um, if this is probably our second most important, in my opinion, um, 
principle for Florida friendly landscaping because the amounts you're watering, how you're watering, these things can really affect the health of your plants, right? The aesthetics of your of your yard. And um, the things I wanna draw y'all's attention to is how much water we use. We don't really realize our impacts, right? Um, US national average, and I think this is actually, it might've gone up a little bit. This might not be completely accurate anymore because this actually was produced in 2020, but the US average in 2020 was 147 gallons per person per day of water used. That's between, you know, showering, washing your hands, flushing the toilet, um, washing your clothes, and then obviously uh, irrigating your yard, which is going to be the biggest drawer of this water, right? So um, about 30 to 60% of our fresh water usage here in Florida is actually used to irrigate, right? Just watering plants, which is crazy. Uh, and when I say plants, I really mean grass, because once again, that grass is gonna always be what needs that water. If I, I've got a completely Florida friendly garden um, right, uh, right out in our landscape here, um, I maybe water once a month in that garden because all of my plants are Florida native or Florida friendly. They're very drought tolerant. You know, we get 60 to 80 inches of water naturally here in Miami-Dade County every year, which is more than enough for our native plants, right? Like I said, they've evolved in Florida for thousands of years without any irrigation. Crazy to think about, right? I know it's an insane concept, but it's true. They don't need irrigation because they are native to Florida, right? They can grow naturally in our native conditions. Um, now, we do also have um, all kinds of great water conserving programs here in Miami-Dade County that I'm going to um, highlight for you guys. And if you're a homeowner with an irrigation system, or even if you don't have an irrigation system, um, I, I encourage you guys to take advantage of these resources because not only will it save you tons of money if you're, if you're buying water from the city, it's going to save you money on your water bill. But even if you have a well, you should still look into these programs because we have a duty as South Floridians to protect and preserve our water resources because they do so much for us, right? I mean, who doesn't like going to the beach? Um, most of us like to eat seafood, right? That seafood comes from the oceans. Um, uh, obviously, the beaches give us tourism. P people literally come to Florida just to go see our beaches. So it gives us economy. It gives us food. It gives us recreation. We won't have any of that if we're not protecting our water quality. And uh, we can do that by um, looking into some of our awesome programs. Uh, like our rain barrel program, you can see uh, we teach rain barrel classes all over the county. We've actually got one coming up next week. It's going to be virtual on a Wednesday. Um, and, oh, actually, sorry, two weeks from now on Wednesday, uh, we're going to be doing a rain barrel workshop with the city of Doral, Doral Glades Park. You can attend in person at the park or virtually. So if you want to learn more about that, my email is coming up at the end of the presentation. Take that and shoot me an email and I'll give you a link to attend. And you guys can get an awesome rain barrel. It's a refurbished plastic food grade rain barrel, 55 gallons, and you get a rebate from the water and sewer department for $50 when you purchase it and attend our class. So um, one rain barrel can save you up to $1,000 in our peak summer months um, just by harvesting rainwater so you don't have to go turn on the spigot every time you want to irrigate. Um, this is just to kind of show you a breakdown of water usage. You can see the, the pie chart on the left. Um, single family home water usage is the bulk of water usage in Florida. And to break that section of single family usage down, you can see about 50% of that is further used to irrigate our, um, our, our landscapes. That's just, in my opinion, an unacceptable amount. Um, you know, especially when grass is really doing nothing for us. You can have a Florida native ground cover in your yard that's beautiful, attracts butterflies, has a nice little flower, and still looks like grass. So I'm going to show you guys that plant in a little bit. But um, this is kind of just in the top right. You can, you can see our impact in Miami. Um, the Miami-Dade County average is about 138 gallons of water per day. Now, it just sounds like a number until you put it here visually to where you can see, wow, that's a lot of water. You know, if, you, if I was to take 138 gallon jugs of water, then I can really see that, yes, I have a huge impact. And obviously, I'm not saying to stop showering and stop washing your hands. Of course, these are necessary things. But if you can save water, even a gallon here or a gallon there, you know, with 2.6 million people in Miami-Dade County, one gallon saved per person per day is a huge, huge difference. Just saying. Okay. So we're going to just irrigate based on, uh, you know, plant needs. Obviously, um, these drought-tolerant um, kind of uh, desert-type plants, xeriscape landscape here, wouldn't need a lot of water, right? I wouldn't want to have that in the same irrigation zone as my grass, right? So keep these things in mind. Um, and things like sh trees, shrubs, ground covers, once they get established, um, you know, after a couple of weeks, they don't even need any irrigation at all. So um, that's why I always say, 
use ground covers, use Florida native plants where possible, because eventually you're going to have no need for any irrigation. So um, this is just to remind you guys, again, always group your plants based on their water needs. It's called a hydrozone. And um, we have an awesome program called the Landscape Irrigation Rebate Program. If you guys have an in-ground pre-existing irrigation system, I really encourage you guys to look into this, whether it's at your house or at your small business, um, or if you own a, you know, a condo, we can uh, like a, you know, an apartment complex, we can, we can rebate those as well. Uh, basically, the water and sewer department funds us to come out to y'all's property, walk the property, make water saving recommendations, and you guys can actually get rebates for any changes, any water saving changes you make to your landscape. And those even include removing irrigation. Say, you know, Dalton really changed my mind. I want to do a completely Florida native landscape. I don't have any more need for my irrigation. Well, you probably want to leave the irrigation in until your plants get established. But afterwards, you can remove that irrigation and get rebated for it from the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. If you don't want to rebate, like you don't want to remove it, you can also update your sprinklers to match application rates. And that's what this slide's about here. You can see we've got um, two of our common sprinkler types here in Miami-Dade County. At the top is a, what's called a spray head. It just kind of emits water in one area, doesn't turn or anything like that. It's just going to stay in that one area, laying down a lot of water, right? Then you've got your rotor, which obviously is going to be rotating, um, spraying a beam of water. So if, if you're running these two sprinkler heads at the same time, obviously that spray that isn't moving, right? It's just hitting the same plants for however long, say it's 15 minutes you have your sprinklers on. It's gonna be hitting the same plants for 15 minutes straight. It's gonna be playing, applying a lot more water than that rotor, which is slowly rotating and hitting different plants. So you run the sprinklers for the same amount of time, but you're laying down different amounts of water on different plants. And that's why we just wanna encourage you guys to try and match your application rates for your sprinklers. You don't wanna be mixing these heads. Say, say I've got uh, three different irrigation zones. I, I don't wanna be mixing these different types of sprinkler heads in the same zone because I'm gonna be overwatering some plants while some are getting underwatered. And then you have all kinds of problems um, in your landscape that are gonna start arising. So, um, you know, we have ways to look into this, right? We have um, actually Jesus is in the, in the uh, presentation right now. Jesus is our uh, landscape irrigation rebate program specialist. Um, he will actually come to your property, either with me or my coworker, Anthony, or possibly even our boss, Laura, and uh, we'll walk the property. This is a 100% free site visit. Make water-saving recommendations, and then you can take these to your contractor, or you can do the work yourself, and like I said, get money back for um, any changes you make. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you some of the changes that we rebate for, things like rain sensors, um, smart timers, which actually prevent irrigation. Um, you know, if, if it's going to rain or if it has just rained, obviously you, you won't want to be watering because then you're going to be overwatering. So we, they actually have timers and other kinds of technology that prevent your irrigation from coming on in the event of if it is going to rain or if it just rained. And that alone will save you so much wa uh, water and so much money. Um, but uh, I, I digress. Um, so this is actually a Florida statute. So if you if you do have um, an automatic irrigation system, meaning uh, like a mechanical or a smart timer powered irrigation system, you need to have a some kind of rain shutoff device. It's actually written into Florida State Legislature now. Um, so just keep that in mind. And um, these are things. If you don't have one, if you if you do have an automatic system but you don't have an, a rain shutoff device, go ahead and give us a call before you make any changes, and you can get money back for those changes. Right? It's a free program. That's awesome. I mean, you guys are going to spend maybe a couple hundred bucks making the changes. You're going to get a lot of that rebated initially, but then the, the amount of money and water you're going to save on your water bill over the course of these things lifetime is going to save you just insane amounts of money. I, it's it, Like I said, it, use your resources that are out there. This is a free program. Look into it. Um, and just here's just kind of a uh, an overview of the program. If you have a large property like a business or um, you know multifamily residence, um, you can get actually $2,850 for any retrofits you make. This is a one-year program. If you have a single family home, like say you live in the Gables and you have a irrigation system, it's a five-year program with $500 available each year. So that's $2,500 over the course of the program. With that kind of money, guys, you can really update dang near your whole system. And like I said, the money you're going to be saving on your water bill, if you have city water, is just going to, these things are going to pay themselves off tenfold over the course of their lifetime, if not more. So why not do it, right? save money, save water, and save our environment. And um, just this is just a little pat on our back to our awesome team. We're five or six strong. 
Um, but our little tiny team can, uh, and this is, this is 2020 numbers. So this number only increases each year as more and more people get involved in our programs. In 2020, so in four years ago now, we saved the county 65 million gallons of water almost in 2020. So um, every little bit counts. Like I said, with 2.6 million people, any adjustment you can make makes a huge difference. Um, just some examples of, of horrible design, um, probably not the right plant, the right place, things like that. Uh, you can see in the first picture, we've got a rotor on the left and a spray on the right. So different application rates and they're right next to each other. Not very smart, is it? Um, we kind of see the same thing in the middle photo. And on the right, we've got that spray laying down a lot of water on that tree that's probably planted a little bit too deep also just by me kind of nitpicking the photo. Um, but you can see that tree is established probably doesn't need that irrigation. You can see it puddling there at the base of it. So that's only going to cause the roots to rot, um, maybe compromise the bark on the tree and allow diseases and pests to get in. So probably not the right plant for the right place there either. All right. So why is this important? I know I'm kind of harping on this a lot, but it's because water, like I said, in South Florida is so, so, so important. Um, it's important because of overdrawing. For, if, if not for the other reasons I've already highlighted, this is the main reason you should be concerned about your water usage. Um, you know, we have a, obviously a freshwater source called the aquifer right beneath our feet here in Miami-Dade County. It's only sometimes a couple of feet beneath the surface, right? Um, so obviously uh, when you're digging a well down into our aquifer, you're drilling down so that you have a source of fresh water that you can pump up from the aquifer, right? Now, if we're all getting off work, let me just give you all a little scenario. We all get off work at 4.35 p.m., head home. When we all get home, you know, some of us want to shower, we want to cook food. You know, we want to do these, all these kinds of things that use a lot of power, use a lot of water. And um, we're drawing a lot of this water, fresh water up from our aquifer. And um, if you don't, if y'all kind of forget, we've got all these water resources full of salt water kind of really close to us, right? So um, obviously we don't want our fresh water getting into our, our, our salt water getting into our freshwater aquifer. But as everyone comes home, you know, 2.7 million people come home from work and start drawing up this water. What happens is we're reducing the pressure in our freshwater aquifer, and then our salt water is able to invade because the, the, the pressure in that system is no longer able to keep that salt water out. And we start seeing the salt water invade our freshwater wells, and then we have problems with um, these, these freshwater wells drying up. In the case of Miami Beach, right? Miami Beach doesn't have any more freshwater wells because they've drawn up all that water from the aquifer and that salt water has invaded their freshwater wells to the point where Miami Beach actually has to purchase water from the city of Miami. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. We don't want to end up like them, right? Um, we need to use them as an example and be conserving our water in the house as well as outdoors. So I already told you about our outdoor water conserving programs, the rain barrels and the LERP program. We also have indoor water rebates you can get. Um, you can uh, install water. Oh, you can't really see that. You can install water saving fixtures, EPA water sense certified fixtures. This includes toilets, shower heads and faucets and get rebates back for uh, from the water and sewer department for any of these things you install in your home. Um, if you're a senior, they actually have a senior high efficiency toilet rebate program where instead of $50, you get back up to $300 for the installation of a high efficiency toilet, um, a, a high efficiency senior toilet, which actually some of these can even like raise or lower to help you, you know, if you have bad knees to help you sit down, things like that. I mean, it, this is there's so much money available for you to install these water saving things. Just look into it, guys. That's all I'm saying. Go on Google, look up Water Use Efficiency Program, Miami-Dade County, and you'll see it all. Um, and this is just kind of to show you our, our proximity to all these water resources, right? We've got the Everglades to the west. We've got the Bay to the east. We've got the aquifer beneath our feet. We've got 80 inches of rain above our head every year. So there's water all around us. We need to protect it, right? And just to show you, uh, just to highlight again, about 50% of the water we use outdoors is actually wasted from inefficient watering practices. So don't don't be in the, the statistic there. We don't want to be that statistic. We want to be on the other side of that 50%, right? And one way you can be on the other side of that 50% is by um, signing up with our LERP program and have Jesus come by your property and he'll do it for free. All right, Rain Barrel Workshops, we've got those upcoming. Um, I, I apologize, these are old pictures, um, but you guys can send, shoot me an email and I'll send you our next upcoming one. Uh, and like I said, that's going to be in two weeks, Wednesday, in the afternoon at 6.30. So you guys will all be at home. You can throw on my Rain Barrel workshop on your computer and um, you'll be done by eight. And uh, you can get a free, uh, not free Rain Barrel, but a rebated Rain Barrel from the uh, Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. And we do all, all other kinds of classes as well. So if you guys wanna get added to our 
uh, upcoming event list, go ahead and shoot me an email and I'll add your, um, your email address to that as well. Realizing appropriately, I've already kind of harped on this, um, but, you know, especially here coming up with May coming up, um, May is actually the start of our, um, our, our rainy season. So actually we have a fertilizer blackout in Miami-Dade County, uh, fertilizer ordinance is very strict. So um, look them up. We don't want to be applying nitrogen or phosphorus in our, in our landscape to our grass. Uh, from May to the end of October. So no, I, and I know it's crazy because you can go into Home Depot and buy a fertilizer, right? During that whole period. It's, it's, I, we need to get, obviously, the corporations on board with these things as well. But uh, obviously, you getting educated as a homeowner is the first step, right? Um, because when you're watering, when you're fertilizing with the rain event about to happen, you're basically doing what that gentleman in the top right photo is doing. You're basically just water, I mean, fertilizing the bay. When fertilizer gets out into the bay, it causes things like algal blooms, right? Algae is a plant uh, technically, and just like plants um, need fertilizer to grow, so does algae. So when we're, we've got already got warming oceans, so now we're pumping all this nitrogen out into our warming ocean, it's sitting underneath the hot sun all day. Of course, we're going to have these crazy algal blooms here in South Florida. And that's what we've been seeing the past couple of years is these really toxic algal blooms come in. Um, when that happens, they take up all the free oxygen in the water which causes fish kills. And also it's gonna be shading out all that seagrass for my manatee fans in the audience. We actually had a record number of manatee deaths in Florida um, a couple of years ago due to starvation because the manatees, also known as sea cows, which eat the seagrass, literally just had no food to eat because of all the algae blooming on the surface, taking up all that sunlight that the algae needs, I mean, the seagrass needs to grow. So if you wanna save the manatees, one way we can do that is by not fertilizing our grass. Okay, mulching is very important because mulching helps um, retain moisture. It also kind of uh, supplements the soil as, you know, those organic pieces break down, um, you know, providing organic fertilizer back to our soil, right? So we're not, we don't want to be buying, you know, inorganic fertilizers. Um, we want to be, we can have a natural source of fertilizer if we're composting and these things are breaking down naturally and providing nitrogen at a more suitable rate with the plant's needs than that um, granular will do, right? Um, so I always like to say, just leave a self-mulching area. You know, if you've got a tree dropping leaves, let those leaves decompose, right? Um, one thing I, I, I hate to see it, I, I see people, I guess I should really be talking about this more in our composting section, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and highlight it now. You know, I, I talked a lot about cut, mowing, blow, landscaping earlier. If you've got your landscapers coming through, mowing your lawn, cutting your branches, you know, things like this, and then they're hauling away all this landscape debris from your yard, you're literally hauling away nutrients that your plants harvested straight from your earth, right? Um, that, that, that tree branch grew from the nutrients that were available in your soil. So when you're hauling that tree branch away, you're hauling away those nutrients. So over time, what we see is a loss of nutrients in our landscape because people aren't what's called nutrient cycling. And um, mulch is a great way to nutrient cycle because you're allowing those things, those leaves and branches and sticks to decompose naturally back into the earth instead of hauling them away, right? We don't need to go buy fertilizer if we're naturally re restoring these nutrients to our landscape, right? <clears throat> oh, and then also, um, uh, we don't really like rubber mulch. We don't really like um, rock mulch. We prefer um, wood mulch because it's organic, right? It helps supplement the soil, helps retain moisture a little bit better, but not any wood mulch will do, right? We want to, uh, here at FFL, we try to recommend people avoid Melaleuca. Um, we try to recommend people avoid Cypress is the really big one um, because a lot of Cypress mulch here in Florida, if you've ever seen a bald Cypress tree, beautiful tree, um, makes a nice mulch too. But unfortunately, um, a lot of this Cypress mulch here in Florida that's commercially available is actually harvested from our natural Cypress forests. So we don't want to support that, right? We want to, uh, I, I personally, especially in Miami-Dade County, prefer pine bark, um, pine bark nuggets because Historically, Miami-Dade County was entirely, almost entirely uh, a pine rockland, which is a really awesome type of habitat found only here in Miami-Dade County. So um, we've got the pine trees naturally, historically in our area. So um, it's a great idea to mulch with pine, pine, mulch, pine bark for that reason, sorry. Um, attracting wildlife, this is the next section I'm gonna kind of harp on a little bit. We're kind of getting towards the end here. Thank you guys for sticking around and learning. And um, I have a bunch of great resources for you guys available for attracting wildlife, but obviously wildlife is great. Um, like I said, uh, you know, we're destroying natural areas to build homes and only planting grass in its place. The least we can do in our landscapes is provide one or two at least 
native plants to give back to our, our wildlife. You know, I live in the Gables myself. And just the other day, I saw a red fox literally in the middle of the night right out front of my house. I live on the edge of Lejeune. So, I mean, I'm, that's a main road. And I saw a red fox. These, these animals still are in these areas, guys. And um, even if it's, you know, usually what, all we're thinking of is birds and butterflies and bees, right? But there's all kinds of things over here, right? I had a possum living in my uh, Spanish lime tree uh, last year. I had, like I said, the red fox. I mean, the wildlife is still here, guys. And we, we need to provide for them because we take so much away from them, right? Um, so always try and choose plants. Native plants, guys, are going to be the best options. Um, but always try and pick plants that provide shelter. They provide food um, for other kinds of wildlife, right? Like small berries, things like that, flowers for nectar. And uh, FYI, guys, not any flowering plant will do, right? Um, sometimes when we go to these home uh, home improvement stores, right, um, these flowers and things like that have been so heavily bred for a big, pretty flower that actually some of these flowers don't even produce nectar anymore. For instance, we've got a, a few different native species of salvia, like our tropical sage. It's a nice, pretty red flower. If you go to Home Depot, you can also find salvia. It's going to be a big, showy flower. And actually, those salvias don't produce any nectar, whereas our native salvias are probably one of the most preferred nectar sources we can plant in our yard. So that's why I always say plant Florida natives. If you guys need to find where to get Florida natives, we have a native nursery list we can send you. If you need recommendations for plants, I have resources I'm going to show you. Like I said, we are just full of resources. We got resources for days over here. Please reach out and we would love, love, love to share them with you. And obviously nectar, oh, sorry, I went to the end of my presentation there. Nectar and pollen um, and host plant sources are very important as well. The nectar obviously is a flower that produces nectar, which is where lots of these invertebrate pollinators get their energy from, right? They eat that nectar. The host plants are plants that butterflies want to lay their eggs on. So butterflies won't just lay their plant their eggs on any plant. If you haven't um, guessed that already, they need very specific plants. Um, so uh, this is a great resource by this man, Jared Daniels, at the top of the page for creating pollinator habitats in our home environments. Jared Daniels is the um, he he runs a lepidoptera lab at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. So um, I actually have a um, guide to Florida butterflies made by him so he's a great resource um but i i just like to show that uh this is a great resource to go along with this photo here that just shows that all environments are important for butterflies not just our natural areas right uh, like for instance i've got a four foot by eight foot garden in my in my, at my house that just has nothing but native plants in it and i i literally have like i must have like 30 caterpillars in my garden right now just a little tiny four foot by eight foot garden just a little you know, piece of patch of heaven in the middle of the gables where it's nothing but, you know, giant oak trees, which oak trees are a really great tree as well. And so are the, uh, the, the, the trees and things like that in the area. But, you know, it's important to have diversity too, right? We don't want it to be planting all the same things. All right. So attracting wildlife, this is just um, some tips for attracting wildlife, right? We want to be very diverse. The more diversity, the better, right? We want to be providing all different kinds of plants at different levels, right? Vertical layering is gonna increase the, you know, sh brush piles and places for animals to hide and breed and things like that. Um, so all these things are important, right? And um, this is a extremely, extremely important. On, on this slide here, you can see that it's recommending you plant different colors, different shapes and different sizes of flowers. For instance, here in, my, here in Florida, our smallest butterfly species can fit on the nail of your pinky finger. It's called the Eastern Pygmy Blue butterfly. Whereas our biggest butterfly, the giant swallowtail, can sometimes be as big as our faces with its wings spread, right? So do I think a butterfly that's the size of my pinky fingernail and a butterfly that's the size of my face are going to be able to access nectar from the same flowers? Probably not. That's a little ridiculous. So if I'm, you know, adding different sizes, shapes, different colors of flowers, right? Because not all insects can see all wavelengths of, of color, right? They need different colors to be attracted to these flowers, help draw them in. That's my, um, that's my recommendation for you. All right, and here's some great resources for you guys to do your own research. Obviously, you can always reach out to us to have some uh, recommendations as well. Um, this is an app you can download on your phone if you've got an Android or an iPhone, or you can just go look it up on Google, the FFL Plants app. And that's what the uh, that little blue square with the state of Florida in it is what the app image looks like. You guys can all go download that right now from your app store, your Google Play store. 
And it's a great resource because you can type in your zip code and it'll kick you back a list of plants that are suitable for your zip code. Say I want a pink ground cover that's good for butterflies in my area. Um, and I, I want it to have a pink flower, right? I can filter out all those details on this app, type in my zip code and it'll kick me back the plants that have a pink flower, ground covers, good for butterflies in my zip code. And oh, looks like I have uh, Mimosa strigulosa. That's a great plant that's a host for a butterfly, a nice native ground cover. And it's even gonna supplement your soil by fixing nitrogen naturally into your soil. So that's just one recommendation for plants. Anyway, as you can see, I'm probably full of them. Uh, EDIS publications are another great way to stay updated on um, US research, uh, IFAS's research. That's, this is kind of the extension part of it, right? Um, EDIS, you can go on there, uh, just go on Google, look up EDIS, IFAS search engine. You can, it's just like Google, you go on to EDIS and I can type in, say I've got a, I'm a home gardener, I've got a spot on my tomato. I can look up tomato diseases in, uh, tomato diseases in Florida and it'll kick back all the UF peer reviewed research articles that have to do with tomato diseases in Florida. Um, so I can find out what the problem is or you can just contact us. But if you wanna do it yourself, that's always available to you as well. IRC natives for your neighborhood. The little excerpt I have on turkey tangle frog fruit down at the bottom is actually directly from the natives for your neighborhood website. And it's a little bit, it's honestly like, it's kind of like our Florida friendly plants app, but just a step above because you enter your zip code on that website as well. Um, and it'll kick you back a list of plants. It'll kick you back a list of habitats that'll be good in your in your area, as well as um, animals like birds, uh, butterflies, all these kinds of things. So Natives for Your Neighborhood is a great website. And whenever I see a plant that I think is really pretty, I like to scroll, I like to click on it and scroll down to the, you can see on the bottom of the screen there, the wildlife and ecology section. So then I can see its interactions in the landscape. I can see this turkey tangle frog fruit, which is the Florida native ground cover, I guarantee all you guys have this growing somewhere in your grass. If you go out and look for a small white flower in your grass, you're going to find this plant. I promise you, like everyone has it. Um, it's a Florida native ground cover. It's a host for uh, like three or four different native butterflies, as well as a nectar plant for far many more. So um, the Island Nota Flora Turkey Tangle is a great option. Um, I don't know if Kurt Klaus is in the audience today, but I've actually, we have a master gardener named Kurt Klaus, and he's actually replaced all the grass in his yard with Turkey Tangle. And I went there to um, recognize his yard as a Florida friendly landscape. And I, I'm literally not even kidding. There were thousands of butterflies all over his yard. It was the most magical thing I've ever seen. If you guys are more of a visual learner, um, you can go on our YouTube right now and um, look up on YouTube, just look up Miami-Dade County UF IFAS extension. And uh, we actually have a uh, all of the videos for our In Your Backyard series that we've done. I did the butterflies, my uh, coworker, Barbara, has done moss, birds, and edibles. Um, we have bees as well that we're editing, hoping to get on there. We might need to refilm that one, uh, but bees will be on there as well. So if you're a bee fanatic, um, go look on there. And like I said, this will be uploaded to our YouTube as well. And uh, just one more resource. This is a great thing. You guys can all go on Google and search right now, or it's on our website at that uh, link above. And actually, uh, my boss actually um, helped out with this. Laura, you can see her name there um, underneath the low maintenance landscape plants, Laura Vasquez. Uh, this is a great resource um, just to kind of just a little chart graph to go through and look at plants, you know, get the visual for them, things like that. All right, managing yard pests responsibly is so, so, so important because, like I said, with our pollinator apocalypse, um, we, improper pesticide use is killing off our, our pollinators, right? Um, not every bug you see in your landscape is a pest. Some things are beneficial. Just today, actually, I had a friend reach out asking about oleander caterpillars, you know, they were eating a little bit of her oleander plant. I said, you know, you can, uh, if you, if you can, like, if you, if you have to get rid of them, just don't, don't apply a pesticide. You can pick them off by hand. But, um, you know, we actually offer identification services here at UF IFAS. So if you do see a pest, you want to know, is this a beneficial or is this a pest? You can send us a photo, send us a sample. We'll tell you, yes, it is, or no, it's not, and how to treat it the least toxic way. Um, so that way you're always assessing as little impact as possible on our environment, right? And um, obviously never go through and just, if you have a pest in your yard, just don't go applying this pesticide all over your yard. If pesticide is the way you decide to go. If, if you do have to use pesticide, try and spot treat, things like that, right? We don't want to be killing beneficials. Pesticide, if we break that word down, the suffix side means to kill. So it's going to kill bugs, whether or not they're a pest, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, Unfortunately, the pesticides aren't selective like that. 
right? It's going to kill butterflies. It's going to kill bees. Um, so if you can use a non-chemical approach to controlling pests, I recommend it. And we can recommend those chemical-free approaches if you contact us. Um, so we, I, I mentioned our rain mural program. We also have a great composting program where attendees get a free composter through the solid waste department. Or if you live on the beach, it's to the Surfrider Foundation. But um, I've already told you about nutrient cycling and why that's important to help you know restore nutrients to your landscape that your landscapers are cutting and falling away, right? Um, but also, if you have a composter on your on your site, right, you can be composting this stuff, and it's going to basically make natural fertilizer for us, right? And also prevent these organic green scraps from getting into our landfill, which is a huge, huge problem. When organic green scraps get put into a landfill without, you know, free oxygen to help those things break down, the only byproducts they're able to turn into are um, methane and carbon dioxide gas, which are our two most harmful greenhouse gases. So if we're composting, we're reducing this input of methane and carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. And the other reason it's so important is because our landfills are just so over encumbered with stuff right now. Um, estimations show that about 90% of the things that have been thrown away could have actually been composted or recycled. So just imagine if our landfills were 90% smaller than they are today, because that's really what they should be if people were properly disposing things. But why is it important? Well, we've got about, um, oh, sorry, that number got messed up. That's supposed to be um, 2.7 million people in Miami Dade County. As of 2019, if we all use about two kilograms of trash a day, which is the global average, that's about five and a half million kilograms of trash every day being produced in Miami County. Now multiply that by 365 days in a year, that's about 1.9, almost 2 million grams, which is converts to 5 million pounds of trash every year. Um, sorry, 2 million million grams. Sorry, so lots, lots and lots of grains, which converts to about 5 million pounds of trash being produced every year in Miami-Dade County. Um, so lots of trash, right? we got to find better ways to manage this stuff. Um, and obviously, these landfills are exposed to the elements. So when it rains, this rain's going to percolate down through that trash and produce this nasty leachate, which can end up in our water, um, our, our obviously, our watersheds and things like that. And we do not want that happening. So we could reduce that by recycling household and yard waste with a composter, right? Um, so I mentioned our composting program. This is uh, the ad for the one that just passed, but we do have some more coming up. So you can go on the Miami Dade uh, Public Library website on their event calendar and search keyword compost and just make sure you're expanding the date range to you know get the next couple months coming up. We should do about one every other month. And if you're a Miami Dade County resident, you can actually get a free composter through the uh, Solid Waste Department or the Surfrider Foundation if you live on Miami Beach. Great program. And it's going to help us reduce stormwater runoff by composting as well. But this is our impact, guys, uh, is stormwater runoff, right? When you're blowing those grass clippings out into your street and they're going down our storm drain, well, hey, guys, grass is essentially nitrogen, right? N grass needs a lot of nitrogen to grow. So a grass clipping is essentially almost pure nitrogen. So if you're pouring nitrogen down our storm drains, it's ending up in our bay. It's basically the same thing as improperly fertilizing, right? Because we're just kicking all this nitrogen out into our bay. Um, so stormwater uh, runoff is a huge, huge thing that we need to be worried about here in the future because it's our impact, right? Um, you know, uh, oil greases, all these kind of pet feces, chemicals like pesticides, fertilizers are the most harmful guys. Um, so I just have a quick little video for us all to watch on our impact. Um, it's a fun little video, very short. Blue, Miami. All right. So that's our impact. You guys can see um, it's it's easier to visualize our impact, right? If all these microscopic, um, you know, contaminants were rubber duckies, right? We would then be able to see our impact. Maybe then we might care a little bit more. We're starting to see the impacts, right? With al al algal blooms and nanty deaths, things like that. 
Um, however, ways we can reduce non-point source pollution, um, let your let your grass clippings break down, decompose naturally back into your grass, guys. Like I said, nutrient cycling. You know, I, I give grass a lot of hate, but if you have some areas in your landscape, say you have grandkids or kids, you want them to have a small spot where they can play outside, it's completely understandable that you want grass. It's way better than artificial turf, just saying. Um, because actually grass is a really good filter. It's an, it's kind of Earth's natural filter from the contaminants getting into our aquifer. But if we're applying a lot of fertilizer, it kind of does away with the good that grass actually can do. So, you know, create bioswales, things to soak up the rainwater before they drain into our storm drains. Um, keep sp spills and leaks, especially with fertilizer, make sure you clean those up um, and getting them out of the landscape. Um, always pick up after your pet if you have pets. Um, those kinds of things are very important, go a long way to helping maintain our water quality here in South Florida. And if you, this is our last principle, so we've made it to the end just about, so thank you everyone for sticking around, um, is protecting the waterfront. If you guys live on a waterfront, um, UF actually recommends about a 10 to 20 foot maintenance free zone, kind of where you're not applying any chemical, you're not mowing, you're not cutting, to just help separate those water bodies from um, any kind of chemical or you know runoff that may occur, right? And you can see on the left side is kind of what we don't want. We've got a nice, beautiful grass lawn coming right up to the edge of a non-porous concrete surface. So if they're fertilizing that grass right before a rain event, that rain is going to run down that hill, run off a non-porous concrete, and go right into that bay right there. So not not ideal. The one on the right side is not much better. Um, you do see somewhat of a low maintenance zone, but honestly, I would prefer to see it even a little bit further. And you can you can plant this low, you can uh, fill out this low maintenance free zone with you know riparian edge, you know aquatic zone aquatic edge plants, things like pickerel weed. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I just blanked on all the aquatic plants I had on mind. Herb of Grace is a great one. But there's there's all kinds of aquatic plants you can plant that have nice attractive flowers, can provide for wildlife and be attractive to look at, more attractive than just a grass bank embankment to the to the um the lake. If you guys, you know, take some of this to heart and you actually incorporate these into your home landscape, we actually offer Florida friendly landscape recognitions in Miami Dade County. So you can go ahead and contact myself or Laura and um we can get you put on the schedule. Um, to have your yard actually recognized. This is actually Kurt Klaus. This is the gentleman I talked about that had the beautiful yard. This was this is when we recognized the yard the first time. When I went back just last year, I mean, millions of butterflies everywhere. And you can see there, look at look underneath his feet. That looks like grass, right? But believe it or not, that's actually phyllonotiflora, all of it. So um, in the summertime, his grass is just full. It just looked like a, a bed of tiny little white flowers just covered in uh, butterflies. Absolutely beautiful. So we'll offer those to you. It's a free pro. That's a 100% free program. You just have to do the checklist, answer a few questions that I send you, and I'll come out for free to your property, walk the property. And the, we used to get with these little yard signs if you receive the recognition, but now we actually got these really nice yard flags. I wish I had one to show you guys, but I just gave my last one out a week or two ago. We got some more coming in. So if you want, to, if you have a, a Florida friendly landscape, reach out to me and I can send you the checklist and maybe get you put on the schedule for recognition. All right, and here are just some more resources. I know um, I, I, I kind of <laughs> kind of uh, drowned you guys with resources, but that's what I'm here for, right? And if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, best management practices, uh, that's a great way to ensure that you're um, you know, assessing as little impact as possible on the environment. For instance, uh, integrated pest management is our best management practices for controlling pests, things like that. You can go on that website and look those things up. If you're interested in learning more about irrigation, we do have some uh, resources there for you to read a little bit more. Uh, the Trek, uh, the Trek resource actually Trek is right around the corner here from us. There are a research facility. Um, they're located right here in South Florida. Um, if you want to read more about our water conservation programs like our landscape irrigation program or our rain barrel program, or um, even just other initiatives we have going on throughout the county, you can uh, go on that website there or just Google search Miami County Water Use Efficiency Program. And then once again, I just wanna highlight our EDIS search engine because it's such a great resource. Um, if you have any kind of environmental question, a bug in your grass, a, a spot in your grass, if, and I, actually, if you have a spot in your grass, send me a sample because it could be like a million things. And we have microscopes here to tell you what the problem is. 
Um, if your landscaper tells you you have chinch bugs in your grass, don't believe him. Send me a sample first before you go dumping pesticide on your lawn. All right, so if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer now. You guys can see our social media there and our YouTube. We have all kinds of videos on our YouTube page, Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, In Your Backyard series, irrigation videos, things like that. And my information is at the bottom of the page, including my uh, email address. You can feel free to, if you didn't get to, um, if we don't get to your question today, you can always shoot me an email and I'll be happy to answer it there. Okay, so we, thank you, Dalton. Uh, we thank have you. answered all the questions in chat and also in the um, question and answer session. So there's nothing that we haven't answered. People were asking for the presentation or the slides later. Yeah. Uh, we have their emails in the registration, so should, we should be able to pull it from there. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you guys for listening. If there's no further questions, um, I, I just want to thank you guys for taking an hour uh, out of your lunchtime to sit down and learn about some Florida Funding Landscaping Initiatives. And I hope you guys uh, you know, were inspired by this and want to apply at least even just one or two of these um, you know, into your own home landscape. Like I said, with uh, South Florida home to so many people, even one or two small adjustments we can make in our landscape to, you know, improve our, um, you know, our, our lessen our impact, right? Any small change we can make goes a long, long, long way. So thank you guys.